Hi, I'm Ben. I'm Jen. So non-standard computer, non-standard background, and... Uh, we well, if you saw our, our one show where we were separate, you've seen this background. This is my background. Right. So uh, the uh, big computer is not available tonight. So um, so there are various technical difficulties. That we're we, slumming it with the laptop. <laughs> that we had earlier Uh when we were trying to do this with the other laptop and StreamYard was not really cooperating, but uh, we're good now. So <laughs> I, anybody who was starting to freak out because they thought they'd have to go a uh, philosophy list Friday, uh, you know, don't worry. That's, that's not the case. Uh, so What's up, y'all? <laughs> what we thought we'd talk about today uh, is just a uh is um, Kant's uh, moral theory? Uh, yeah, that was the I, I could understand, <laughs> right? That's that's a totally reasonable reaction, but it's okay because we're back. We're back. Nice <laughs> to have you back, Ryan. You've been missing us uh, the last few weeks. Don't right. think we haven't noticed. Right. Exactly. Or at the very least, I've noticed. <laughs> Who's Ryan? That's uh, a long story. Okay. All right. Anyway. Uh, so uh, Ryan's we, my favorite person. Wow, wow, <laughs> that hurts every time. <laughs> okay, so uh, Kant, yeah, so I thought maybe we could start out with a little uh brush up on uh the categorical imperative, uh, which is uh, outstanding, which is uh, which is Kant's moral theory. So, um, do you want to uh, kick us off with that, Kant? He was big into duties, moral rules, don't lie, don't kill, don't steal, very Ten Commandment-y uh, without the graven idols and stuff. But uh, one of his rules was that you shouldn't lie. And his rules did not allow for exceptions. And so this dude, Benjamin Constant, decided to be like, well, you know what, Kant? I bet I can get you to cave. And I'm going to give you this scenario where you will be forced to admit that lying is the right thing to do. So I wonder if maybe before getting into it, it might be worth uh, taking a couple steps back. And step on back then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, step on yeah. back. Step in, slide in, you know, going back in some form or another. Uh, so uh, this the specific way that Kant's moral rules work. Oh, you're going all in depth on Kant. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Everybody's getting the primo of content right now. Uh, so, content. <laughs> So uh, if you watched, uh, listened to uh, the Beginner's Guide to Kant uh, episode we did to patrons, you know all this, but just as a real quick uh, review of how it works. So Kant's... Um, yeah, that dude. Uh, <laughs> yes, exactly. Kant, uh, as Silver Harlow says, is the categorical imperative, dude. Uh, so categorical is, as opposed to hypothetical, a hypothetical <laughs> imperative is... A, an imperative that only applies oh boy, to you here we go. if you happen to share some goal. Uh, Existential Comics uh, is a philosophy themed webcomic that I like. It has, and they have a little thing at the top where they'll say, like, you know, 500 days without a canned Kant pun. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> if only we were so lucky as to go 500 days. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, so a hypothetical imperative is an imperative that only applies to you if you happen to share some goal. So they say if you want to go to law school, you should study for the LSAT, the law school admissions you know, test. Uh, but, that, but that goal does not, or that rule does not apply to me. Why? Because I am not a fool. I don't want to go to law school. Hey, that rhymed. And yes, my, my hair is blowing dramatically. We're having a heat wave in Michigan, so we have numerous fans uh, going here. Sexual. Numerous fans in two different ways. But yeah, my, my mother-in-law tells me that we're under some sort of heat dome or something uh, that, that will be moving moving on soon. 
So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So they, not that, you know, not that going to law school, you know, uh, I would argue that doesn't necessarily make you a fool. You know, you probably need some, some lawyers for uh, various purposes, but I, me, for me going to law school would be idiotic. All right. I mean, I have a good job. I'm very happy with my job. Why would I spend my time and money going to law school? Fair enough. So given that, that should, you should study for the LSAT doesn't apply to you. No, it does not. Uh, whereas a categorical imperative is an imperative that's supposed to apply to everybody. Uh, regardless of your goals. Uh, it's So it's not like if you want to be a good guy, you shouldn't kill people. It's just that you shouldn't kill people. Yeah, it doesn't matter to Kant whether you want to be a good guy or not. This is irrelevant to him. Your wants, your needs, your desires, he doesn't care. So it doesn't matter whether or not you want to be a good guy, you just shouldn't murder people. Yeah, so specifically, you said his, his want, your wants... Okay, wants, needs, desires. Those were it. Uh, don't, uh, don't, or we, goals, goals, or ends, ends. as Cot might put it. Your <laughs> ends uh, it applies to you regardless of your ends, uh, because a categorical imperative is supposed to delineate what counts as a morally acceptable end to to have. Uh, so specifically, categorical imperative tells you that you uh, should only act on that maxim that you could will to be a universal law. So <sighs> this makes me all hot and bothered every time you say that. You only act on that maxim that you could <laughs> will to be a universal <laughs> law. I can't take it. I need those smelling salts that my mom has to use whenever somebody curses. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> She objected to this. <laughs> she loved that I said that the last time. Implication that that was the case. <laughs> but in any case, um, to be fair, I don't think it is. <laughs> it's very close, though. It's very close. Wow. All right. Um, hi, Francine. I don't want to make you mad. Uh, I guess Jen does. But anyway. Um, <laughs> So, so what that means is that uh, the only maxims, the only rules of conduct that it's acceptable to act on are ones that you could uh, make universal. In other words, that it could be the case that everybody acted that way without that, uh, crucially, without that there being some sort of inconsistency of the very idea of everybody acting that way or without everybody acting that way being inconsistent with your needs, desires, and all that business, right? So um, in other words, that you're acting, everybody acting that way can't be inconsistent with your reason for uh, acting that way in the first place. So you can, uh, one way of thinking about this, and I know there are, it's like that line in uh, Star Wars about all the, you know, the, was it this feeling all of the minds, you know, crying out in pain at once. So Alderaan is destroyed. I can feel all the cot scholars crying out in pain because this is going to be such an oversimplification, but that's okay. Uh, the, Who among us is a cot scholar? And why would you do that with your life <laughs> is the more relevant question, I think. Wow. <laughs> Picking all kinds of fights today. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, like one way of thinking about this is that you're, if you act in a way that everybody couldn't act, or at least if everybody acted that way, you know, your plan wouldn't work if everybody acted that way. Uh, do you want to give an example? I do, but in, uh, at the end of the sentence, uh, so. <laughs> Excuse me. So everybody acted that if if you're acted in a way that everybody acted that way would ruin your plan, then you're acting as if you had some special moral status that everybody else doesn't have. That you know your you and your ends are more important than every, everybody else and their ends. You are not special, right? This is what Kant would like you to understand. You are not special, <laughs> no matter what your mother has told you. Uh, um, 
<laughs> Why are you watching the Blue Jays in the first place? Come on, bro. <laughs> so, uh, in any case. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I miss the Astros many times because I have to be doing this. So, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so yeah. So, for example, right? Like, mm-hmm. what if what if Kant's uh, examples that he gives this and the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals is uh, making false promises? Yes. Is now when we talk about that? Now would be an excellent time to talk about it. Okay. So let's say that I am heavily in debt to the mob. As is, you know. As one is. Sure. And um, I really value. Let's talk about that later. Okay. Like off air. Mm. Um, I value the integrity of my kneecaps. So I need to get some money to pay off the mob. So I tell Ben, hey, I, um, I need some money. I'll pay you back to pay him back i know i'm not going to be able to pay him back um so when i tell him i pay him back i'm going to pay him back i am making a lying promise and i wonder is this morally correct and for some reason i don't just know that this is not morally correct i have to go through this process of reasoning so um so the way i start this out is i say to myself (laughs) No. So I say to myself, what maxim am I acting on here? And the maxim I'm acting on is when I'm in trouble, I am allowed to make a lying promise. And then I universalize the maxim because remember, I am not special. So except, do you think I'm special, Ben? We'll talk about that later. (laughs) Off air. (laughs) Um, Maybe my bus will show up. Um. Yeah, so I universalize my maxim. Whenever anyone is in trouble, they may make a lying promise. Now, is this something that I could rationally will to come into being? So if I had everybody acting on that rule, whenever anyone is in trouble, they may make a lying promise. What, thank you, Ryan. What's going to happen? What's going to happen is that promising will no longer be possible because no one will ever take the words I promise seriously ever again. Now I feel less special. So if no one, (laughs) so if no one can make a promise anymore, but what you want to do is to make a promise, you're willing both that promises do and do not exist at the same time this is a logical contradiction. And, and from that, you know that lying, making a lying promise is wrong, which is really the only way you could ever know that making a lying promise is wrong is to go through this process. But yeah, so this is, this is the idea behind avoiding the logical contradictions. If universalizing the maxim that you're acting on would lead to a contradiction, then you can't do it. Yeah, so... Yeah, try and follow that up. <laughs> so lying is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> lying is wrong. He also has so that so we said earlier, you know, went through what it means to call a uh, imperative, which in context just I mean an imperative grammatically is when you're telling somebody to do something, but in context it just means like rule. Uh, what it means to call an imperative categorical, but crucially he it's the categorical imperative. There's only supposed to be the one. But confusingly, he does give multiple formulations of it. And to give something, you know, moral philosophy, something to do for the next couple hundred years to try to say, well, what exactly? Thanks, bro. How did he think that these were the same one? Uh, it, can we defend the claim that these are really the same rule? Or are these just different rules that, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Whatever else it means, it seems to at least mean that Kant thinks that you can get all the same results from them. One of y'all figure out if this is possible and report back to us. (laughs) So uh, he has a few different, uh, he has a few different formulations, but the one we just gave is the formula of universal law. The other main one is the formula of humanity. So the formula of humanity. Oh, the humanity. (laughs) Exactly. Formula of humanity says... 
uh, that uh, you should always treat humanity, whether in your own person or that of another, as an end in itself and not merely as a means to an end. Man had a way with words. So, uh, whether in thine own person um, or in the person of another. Yes. Uh, so don't treat people merely as means to an end, treat them uh, as ends in themselves. Uh, what it, so the crucial, both of these I think uh, can be misinterpreted. Uh, usually when people are misinterpreting the formula of universal law, it's because they, they think that he's saying don't treat other, don't um, act on maxims that you wouldn't will to be universal laws, but that's not it. Yeah, because people will start talking about, oh, well, what would it be like to live in a world where everybody lied all the time? That doesn't matter. Yeah, it's not, it's, this isn't like some sneaky form of utilitarianism where ultimately, we're, is not. ultimately we're still looking at good and bad consequences. It is not. Good and bad consequences are beside the point. Kant thinks of this. As we will see. <laughs> exactly. Kant thinks of this uh, as a kind of test of consistency, which one way to think about that is maybe when you uh, act in a certain way, you're making an implicit statement about how everybody should act all the time. Uh, but whatever, Kant, Kant sees it in those terms, you know, as, as, a, as an issue of like you're being irrational if you do things that can't be universalized. And Kant loves rationality. He went to bed every night with a poster that said irrationality or that said rationality, yeah, 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 yeah. rationality. He'd be too upset to sleep. Yeah. If the on the, poster. on the ceiling over his bed. Yeah. So, uh, so this is not, this is not a sneaky form of utilitarianism. It's not a fancy form of the golden rule. You know, Oh, how would you like it? If everybody did that, not the point. It's not treating people's souls like numbers. None of that stuff. None of that stuff. Uh, so, and with the formula of humanity, you know, which remember, uh, always treat humanity, whether in thine, in own, thine own person or that of another, uh, as a uh, end in itself and not merely as a means to an end. Uh, so, um, I have a feeling he had views about it. He had a lot of weird views, but anyway, uh, this he, uh, this is the um, the point. A lot of times people misinterpret that when they first hear it because they miss the merely. Or only. Or, or solely. Yes, whatever translation you're using. The, uh, but there's some word like that before uh, a means to an end because it's fine to treat people as means to an end. Uh, I it, treat you as means to an end all the time. I like it, see? So, uh, <laughs> so um, hi, John. Uh, what up? <laughs> So if you ask your friend for a ride to the airport, you're treating them as a means to an end, but Kant doesn't think you're doing anything morally wrong. Yeah, uh, I asked you for a ride to the airport right after we started dating. Right? It's like, hey, Ben, I need to go to the airport. Will you take me? See, there you go. There you go. Uh, so uh, that's fine. It's the merely and... What it takes to treat somebody as merely a means to an end, as opposed to just treating them as a as a means, you know, as a means to an end, is uh, if you're advancing their own ends. Right. So when I asked Ben to take me to the airport, I was advancing my end. I was using him as a means to advance my end of getting to the airport so that I could go see my sister Anna, and Ben was treating me as a means to his own ends to have enjoyable female companionship. There we go. Uh, so, uh, so at least a sort of rough intuitive idea of the difference between treating somebody as a means to an end, treat somebody as merely as a means to an end. Um, you know, you could, you know, think about like uh, this, uh, this Dr. Pepper, um, uh, that is a Dr. Pepper cream soda, okay, my good sir. Dr. Pepper cream soda, right? All right. Uh, so uh, if if you had bought this Dr. Pepper cream soda from a vending machine, do they serve? Do they sell Dr. Pepper cream sodas from vending machines? Well, I've never seen it in a vending machine, but then we haven't been out of the house that much. True. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. 
try to make up for lost time now, but uh, yeah, still haven't been to a lot of vending machines though. Yeah, well, if you did and you were buying a Dr. Pepper cream soda for the vending machine, and it did that thing it does, uh, vending machines do sometimes, where it takes your dollar and, and you punch it, and it comes halfway out, and, and you punch it, doesn't quite come out, then yeah, you might. You might like slam the side of the machine to try to dislodge punch it. Punch it. Like punch it forward. Dr. Uh, Pepper is the official drink of Texas. And that's really all that matters <laughs> is what I have to say. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Moving on. Yeah. Yeah. But if I had bought this Dr. Pepper in don't, a store... Don't mess with my Texans. So, yes, if you uh, bought this Dr. Pepper in a store, no matter how much trouble the cashier was having with your order... I could not punch the cashier. Because you... Or slap the cashier, slap the cashier upside the head. That's a no-no. Any of that stuff. Any of that. So Because you correctly say the vending machine literally is merely a means uh, to various human ends. Uh, yeah, the vending machine has no ends of its own. Whereas the cashier is a person and, and needs to be respected as such and not reduced to the level of merely a means to an end. And when I buy the Dr. Pepper from the cashier, the cashier is, uh, is a means to my end. <laughs> Let me tell you about the time he tried to take oh me to God. a 7-Eleven on a date, but I that is not neither try here to, nor there. That is not what happened. That is exactly what <laughs> happened. not all what So happened. <laughs> I am using the cashier as a means to my end of getting a delicious beverage. The cashier is using me as a means, as a means to their ends of making a living. So nobody is, is committing the solely, only, merely sin. Uh, no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I will never be a Georgian. I will be a Texan residing in Georgia. Fair enough. Um, and crucially, you can explain the lion thing with the formula of humanity, too. Uh, which, you, again, you're supposed to be able to explain anything you can with one with the other. because And you get the same answer. At least according to Kant, these are equivalent. So uh, if I, you know, if Jen lies to me so she gets the money to pay the mob, uh, then I, she's, instead of telling me, look, I need this money for the mob, I probably will not be able to pay it back. And then and Ben would be like, what the hell are you coming to me for? <laughs> <laughs> and then leaving it up to me to decide. Sorry, Franny, I cursed. To decide what to do with uh, uh, with that information, mm -hmm. uh, then um, then you're instead just treating me as a ATM. You know that uh, that you know you're trying to manipulate me so that I will serve your ends when I, given my ends, I would not. You know, if left to my own devices if given the correct information. Okay, and and we could generally like expand that out. I mean, the reasons that people lie to each other are generally that they want to control the behavior of the person they're lying to. Uh, if, um, you know, if I tell him that he that I won't be able to repay him, he won't give me the money. If, uh, if I tell her what really happened at the party, she'll be mad at me, whatever, you know, all that. <laughs> All that stuff. What? So, uh, hypothetical example. Uh, so, you want to talk about that? <laughs> you're very special to me. Uh, so, <laughs> now he says that. Um, yeah. All right. So, Benjamin Constant, uh, French philosopher. Uh, his big thing was he wrote something I think you could find at earlymoderntext.com called like the liberties of the ancients and the moderns or something. But that's a page turner right there. <laughs> uh, but what matters, uh, yeah, the, what, what Jen <laughs> claims happened here is not all what happened. Uh, nice. <laughs> We're just talking about how lying is wrong, Ben, and here you are lying to your loyal yeah. fans. <laughs> See, I am not uh, neat, uh, not in employment, education, or training. I am in various forms of employment. Uh, so, Jacobin, the self-employment here at Give Them an Argument, uh, 
still still holding on to one adjunct class in the fall. Wait, should I be getting paid for this? Because I'm not getting paid for this. <laughs> well, what's mine is yours anyway. So. Um, yeah, then what's mine? What's yours is mine, and what's mine is mine. <laughs> this is how marriage works. <laughs> what's yours is mine. All those. No, <laughs> so, nobody agreed with that. So anyway. Uh, anyway. When do we get to the inquiring murderer? How about now? How about now? Why don't you tell it? Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, Jay Andrew World, uh, our very talented graphic designer, is uh, visits us in uh, Michigan, Georgia, wherever. Uh, Texas. At, <laughs> I don't know what those circumstances would be, but okay. Uh, and he's sitting... Um, and he's sitting in the living room, minding his own business, uh, and a uh, man in a hockey mask, uh, holding an axe with blood dripping, you know, from it, uh, comes to uh, the door, rings the doors, you know, polite murder, uh, and says, "You know, is J. Andrew World here?" Uh, and one would think, Benjamin Constant would think, that the morally correct thing to do in this situation is to say. No. no. <laughs> uh, and he would be about to not be there because I would be like, Jay Andrew, get the bleepity bleep bleep out my house. So, well, what? With the murderer still outside? <laughs> well, he can go out the back door. Okay, okay. Not really. So, and this is a problem because we just said that Kant's. Kant thinks that these are like universal commandments of rationality that you're not, it's, it's not about whether the consequences are good or bad. You could, you could do go back to a previous topic of these philosophy Friday streams. Uh, you know, you push the large man off the uh, bridge onto the trolley tracks. The consequences are much better than if you didn't. Uh, you have one person who dies as opposed to five innocent people who die. Uh, but that would very much violate the categorical imperative. You can't do that. So it's not supposed to be about consequences. Uh, and these are supposed to be uh, perfect duties. In other words, like Kant does have room for a certain, for imperfect duties, meaning things that it would be wrong not to do sometimes, but it's, you don't have a, never-ending obligation to do it. It'd be wrong to... Like helping the needy. You right. have to help the needy sometimes, but you don't have to help every needy person, every charity, every time somebody asks for money, you don't have to say... <laughs> you don't have to say yes. You can pick and choose uh, as long as you do it sometimes. Right. But because lying, the act of lying violates the categorical imperative, that's a perfect duty not to do that, that you that you just have to be constantly not lying 24-7. Uh, doesn't mean you have to constantly volunteer any, uh, uh, everything that crosses your mind 24-7. Wait, what? <laughs> but uh, it, uh, it does mean... <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, but it does mean that 24-7 uh, you can't lie. Same way that you don't necessarily have to crisscross the world 24 7 saving people's lives but all the time you you have to not murder you you know you have all to, the time like, you must refrain from murder yeah like even in your sleep you have to refrain from murdering people uh so <laughs> uh, and lion is like this so benjamin constant points out hold up if if we have a perfect duty not to lie because ever telling a lie violates categorical imperative what about if an inquiring murderer shows up at your door uh, asking if you know where the victim is, and you do, uh, then do you have to, or asking if the victim is inside, maybe, uh, then do you have to tell him the truth? And Kant... And he thinks that this has pushed Kant into a corner because Kant is going to have to be like, well, okay, you're right. In this situation... You should lie to the bloody axe wielding crazy person. But instead, Kant's like, uh uh, Benny boy, you should tell the truth. Sorry, Jay Andrew. 
Yeah. Yeah. Kant, Kant is, uh, Kant bites the bullet and this and, is a classic dilemma. Yeah. Kant not only bites the bullet, but he, he, he like chews it up and, you know, uh, digest it digests swiftly. it the little pieces of bullet, you know? So, uh, yeah, no hesitation, uh, whatsoever. No one puts Kant in the corner. Uh, that is not how we do. Ed, Kantians, people who like are alive now or whatever in the couple hundred years since then, people who generally agree with Kant's moral theory have always found this a little embarrassing. Huh. Why do you think that is? <laughs> because it's a insane conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> and what you say that you should do is obviously gravely morally wrong uh, to, uh, to do. Uh, and yeah, of course, Kant was, so Kant was right in at the end of the 18th century. Uh, but, um, but like when people talk about this after the mid 20th century, very often the way they frame it, you know, it's, is uh, like the Nazi at the door. The inquiring Nazi. Because if you are in that Anne Frank sort of, you know, situation that, uh, that you're a Gentile and Nazi occupied Europe somewhere and, there's a Jewish family hiding in your attic and the uh, very polite Nazi comes to your door and says, Pardon me, sir. <laughs> Are there by any chance any Jews in that attic? <laughs> Why, yes. <laughs> yes, there are. Yeah, defeats the point. Uh, in fact, yeah, when I do this in um, in-person classes, I show people, I always show my students the opening scene of uh, Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards. When I've never seen this movie, but I've seen that scene like 25 times. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a great scene. Uh, so, and, uh, and so Hans Landau is a colonel of the SS, comes to this farmhouse in France uh, where he strongly suspects there are some hiding Jews. And uh, he has this whole very ominous dialogue with the farmer it's very funny, but also suspense is building. Uh, and, and then he gets him to admit, you know, where, that there are Jews hiding there to tell him where they are. And of course, if the French farmer had um, read the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, uh, French translation, you know, before Hans Landau came by. Uh, well, I thought that's what he was doing when, <laughs> yeah, when he showed up. I thought he was. Yeah, I think you see at the beginning of the movie, he's like hanging laundry or something. So. Uh, <laughs> hanging laundry with one hand he's got the book in the other hand yeah uh, I'm very fond of Inglorious Bastards but I will not deny that that may be the best scene in the movie there's nothing else that quite lives up to it okay good then I don't ever need to watch it so I've seen the best part <laughs> repeatedly I mean there are many good parts to that movie but I think that's probably the best part um, yeah I was talking to uh, Nando uh, Vila about that a couple weeks ago. He also is a. Uh, uh, he also uh, thinks. I think he thinks they're good parts. I think he, I you know I, I think his overall opinion of the movie is lower than mine. But he but he he thinks there are some very good parts to it. But anyway, the dog has been licking my foot in this one spot for like twenty minutes, and my foot is numb in that spot. Why don't you just pick up your foot? Oh, it's too cute. <laughs> so, um, yeah. All right, so Kant bites the bullet. He actually does this thing where it's kind of amazing. It's like, okay, it's Kant is like one of, like in terms of the most important, the most insightful, you know, philosophers who's ever lived. He's way up there. But like this little essay that he writes responding to Constant is weird. It is weird. Um, one of the professors I had in my master's program at the University of Houston said that it was possible that Kant was senile by this time, so we really shouldn't take it that seriously, but it is still in his set of writings, so, you know, we, we still, we need to, <laughs> to deal with it, but we should perhaps not give it the, the weight and the heft uh, that we give to the other stuff. Yeah, like he says things in that paper, like, constant suggests that he could help, he could make sense of this because the murder doesn't have the right to the truth, and Kant says, well, what do you mean? Right to the, you know, right to the... But Kant says it doesn't matter. He says, this, you're right. This guy doesn't have the right to get the truth because he's forcing an answer from you 
in a, in an unjust way. So he doesn't have the right to the truth. So when you, but if you lie to him, you're not wronging him because he has no right to get the truth from you, but you are wronging the entirety of humanity. Not him though, <laughs> not that guy, but the rest, the, of, the the rest of humanity, you are wronging them. Oh yeah, Bar Saved and Glorious Bastards is very, very good. I love that. Um, and uh, and I suppose I'm also wronging Jay Andrew by telling the murderer that he's not there because he's part of humanity, which also seems weird. But you know what ends? Yeah, uh, that that line about how um, uh, the the guy the the British spy you know thinks he's about to die and he says. Uh, Wait, what are we bingoing? Uh, it's also a line from *Glorious Bastards*. Okay. Uh, and he says, uh, and he has this like really nice like glass of scotch, and he's like, "Well, there's probably you know probably a, a special place in hell for people who waste good scotch." And uh, since I'm likely to uh, to be on my way there shortly, which is you know a nice you know like a, I'd, I'd like to think that if I'm ever about to be in a shootout with Nazis, that I would have the presence of mind to have a good line like that. But anyway, sure, sure. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's so some later Kantians might be inclined to dismiss this as uh, Emmanuel getting a little senile. Uh, but it no, is, Manny, go to bed. <laughs> it's also, uh, but it's also um, a little tricky to explain given Kant's like basic commitments what he could have said that would be consistent with his overall moral theory and that wouldn't have involved embracing this. I don't know. Maybe we have a duty to not contribute to an innocent person's death. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> so uh, what is that a perfect or an imperfect duty right there? Um, so one thing that this Richard McCarty, uh, has a paper called, I think, Kant and the Right to Lie, uh, where one of the things he points out, I guess to set this up, we should say, like oftentimes when you would you uh, lay this on uh, introductory students, um, they'll try to say, well, maybe you could say something that was like evasive, but technically true. Oh, yeah, they always try to get out of it. So, you know, I just present it as the guy says, yes or no, or I'll ax you. Yeah. And of course, if you could get out of the situation by doing that, I guess, I mean, we could have a discussion about whether it's really any better by Kantian standards to uh, knowingly mislead people than to lie to them. But, uh, but like the real problem is what if, what if this situation is such that that's not going to work? It's one of the reasons I like that scene from Inglorious Bastards because Hans Landau is a very clever Nazi. And if you say something that's evasive and technically true and quote, I mean, really, if the Nazi isn't a complete idiot, if you say something that's sort of like coy and technically true, but a little evasive, then that's going to have the same effect as saying, yeah, they're, they're in here. Come on, come on inside. Uh, which is one of the things that, um, that McCarty picks up on since... He says, well, we might be one way um, to try to get out of this that he rejects. Here's to you, Dr. Pepper hating guy. Is that, yeah, man, we do not want to insult the Texans, uh, Dr. Pepper. Uh, so uh, is you might say, well, uh, if the murderer doesn't know that you know they're a murderer, then the maxim... Uh, lie to people who are murderers asking about their intended victims uh, can be universalized because it will work because they if they don't know that you know you're their murderer, uh, then... So he can't be holding a bloody ass. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, it's, it, this only works in certain... <laughs> if he's left his bloody axe around the corner. Exactly. He also has a nice example where he points out that, like, the maxim... Say that the maxim... Uh, lie to inquiring murderers technically passes is a little bit like saying that the maxim uh, lie to inquiring dog owners on weekends. Like if somebody asks if you've seen their missing dog 
And, uh, and well, maybe if they don't realize it's a weekend, they forgot what day it was, <laughs> uh, then, uh, then lying to them will, will work because they'll know that lying, lying to inquiry dog owners on weekends is universalized, but it, it basically says you're missing the point if you try anything like this because this is not supposed to be like the whole point of the universalization test is that everybody knows what's up. Uh, every like that. Uh, in other words, that it's uh, that how would, you know, if the other agent knew that everybody was acting in a certain way, right, would this work? That's the point of the universalization test. So he says that won't work, but he does want to hone in on that point about how if you say something that's evasive and technically true, like I've had students suggest, you say, well, I don't know where they are. And then they'll explain that, you know, it's, it's possible that they left when you're starting the conversation. So you don't know for sure where they are. Uh, if, um, I mean, if you say anything that's like, well, it's possible that they could be anywhere, uh, then that's true. The inquiry murder will say, okay, they've just made a face of the, you know, I'll bet Jay Andrews inside. And I'm going to ask you and Andrew just for that. And it'll have the same effect uh, as. Sorry, Jay Andrew. Andy. Uh, Jay Andrew. <laughs> it'll have the same effect as if you, uh, as if you just said, yes. And so McCarty says, well, maybe there's something that we can like figure out a Kantian loophole for the fact that this is a, a what he calls a trap question. In other words, a question where a refuse that's set up in such a way that refusing to answer basically is an answer. So he gives the example of McCarty of he said he was at a coffee shop and uh, the person who's ahead of him in line was talking to the barista. And the barista clearly knew him well enough to ask him personal questions, uh, or felt that she did, uh, and uh, and and she uh, uh, and she said, "Are you straight?" And he says, um, "You know." And, and he's and the guy said, uh, "What? I, I I don't understand what you mean," or something like that. And she's like, "Oh, you know what you know what I mean? Are you straight?" And he said something else like that, and of course, every come on, brother, <laughs> every attempt on his part to pretend not to get the question, perhaps because he didn't want to talk about his sexuality in front of random strangers, you know, at the coffee, you know, who knows, right? Like, uh, every, Why does? Nothing to be embarrassed about. Well, fair enough. This paper was, you know, probably written in a less enlightened time. But regardless, uh, you know, that uh, he, was, he was being asked about information that he would have preferred to be kept, kept private. He didn't want to outright lie. So he was, you know, so he was being evasive and the effect of the evasion is to answer the question. And so it says, well, maybe when you're being asked a trap question, uh, your freedom is being, Kant is also big into freedom. Your freedom is being hindered uh, because you're not allowed to decide which information you're keeping private and, and which you're disclosing. Uh, like he, he says at one point, you're being treated as if you were like a speaking machine, uh, you know, could like just punch in the question and the answer will come out. Uh, and so your freedom to decide what to keep private is being hindered. So maybe you can hinder this hindrance of your freedom. Ooh, <laughs> and, uh, I like to hinder the hindrances. And, and that's okay, right? That works out. Um, so... The title of this is uh, the uh, so is Kant and the right to lie, and the idea is well, it's not because telling the truth would have such bad consequences, or because the person asked you is evil. It's that uh, trap questions are themselves bad on Kantian grounds. So the same, you know, so uh, that allows you to to you know, like your freedom is being hindered, so you're allowed to restore your freedom by hindering the hindrance. Uh, and he but this seems to have the same problem as, you know, Kant says you're not wronging the guy that that you're lying to. You're not wronging the, the inquiring murderer because he doesn't have the right to put you in this position, just like the person asking the trap question. Yeah, yeah, that 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 is a highly, highly negative 
uh, yeah. experience in life. Yeah. So, so he also sweet tea in places don't have sweet tea. That's also upsetting. Yeah. Um, Took me a while to realize that when Jed said tea, she meant sweet iced tea. Yeah, that's what tea is. <laughs> so, uh, not like hot bitter leaf water. Um. Anyway, yeah. uh, <laughs> credit to my friend Susanna. That that's her phrase, not mine. Yeah. What was I saying? I was saying something very deep. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, so, so. This yeah. So you're not wronging the inquiring murderer by lying to him. You're you're wronging the rest of humanity. So how can still? So it seems like you're you're not wronging trap question guy if you lie, but right. you are still wronging the rest of humanity. Yeah. To be fair, I think McCarty's idea is the trap question guy because he's hindering your freedom. That it's not so much that he doesn't deserve the truth, like Constance's idea, as just that you're allowed to like foil him in this attempt. Uh, I think there are some. I don't think this really works on Gotcha Grounds. Uh, it's an interesting try. Uh, there's another good try uh, in uh, a paper called uh, "The Murder at the Door: What Cops Should Have Said" by Michael Cholby. I guess how you say say his name. Uh, and Cholby finds this passage where Kant seems to suggest that you're allowed to, um, like, it's in, like, one of the lectures or something where Kant seems to suggest that it might be okay to lie in order to uh, preserve your life because you have a, um, uh, because you have a perfect duty to preserve your life. And you also have a duty to preserve the lives of others. Exactly. So like he's, Jay Andrew sitting on couch. Right. So the so Cholby's idea, like the the moves are, you have a perfect duty to um, uh, to preserve your life, uh, and so therefore, if if you are uh, therefore if you're being asked a question where you know, the only way to preserve your life is to lie. You can do that. Uh, he didn't use this example, but I kind of thought, I don't think Kant did either, but like the, what I sort of went to is, um, I remember uh, Hilary Mantel's book, uh, Wolf Hall. Uh, good it, book. Yeah, very good book. Highly recommend it. Uh, and it's, it's set in the court of uh, Henry VIII, and a big plot point involves... Uh, uh, Thomas More is like a Catholic holdout after after Henry declares himself to be the head of the church uh, in England, and he makes everybody take this um, uh, this oath, uh, you know, say you know, saying that uh, affirming that he's the head of the church, uh, and uh, Thomas More, uh, what you know, like wants to just be allowed to just sort of pass on what he thinks about this, you know, uh, no comment. Uh, and, and that, that won't do right. You know, ultimately his refusal to take the oath is taken as him denying it. Uh, and he's killed. Uh, so, you know, you might think that, you know, maybe Kant is thinking of a situation like this. Um, and Michigan is not normally this way. No, this is, weird. this is, this is having lived the vast majority of my life in Texas and Miami. I know humidity and this mm, usually yeah. there's no such thing as humidity in Michigan. Yeah. Even if the people here think they are having humidity, they aren't, but right now they are. Right. <laughs> uh, normally, um, you know, normally I, yeah, like summer in Michigan is great. Like, like when I lived, this sucks. When I lived in Miami, uh, when I go back visit family in Michigan uh, over the summer, it was always fantastic for that reason. Uh, it's like nice temperate summers. Uh, right now, it's it's no good. Uh, and yeah, which uh, Wolf Hall is even so man for all seasons is uh, kind of glorifying Thomas More. Um, Wolf Hall, uh, the main character is, is Thomas Cromwell, and definitely Hilary Mantel is on team uh Cromwell not more out of, out of the Thomases uh because so many Thomases so many teams <laughs> had really pointed out that uh 
you know, Moore himself, you know, being treated as sort of a religious freedom martyr is a little weird because he had tons of people burned at the stake, you know, for uh, uh, Catholic reasons. Quit but rubbing it in, Jay Andrew. We're trying to save your stupid life over here. So, um, it's not the time. Okay, so uh, you have to preserve your own life, uh, and there is a duty to preserve life, whether in thine own person. <laughs> Yeah. Or in that of another. Well, that's exactly the move that he makes. If you can do it to preserve your own life, he says he attributes to Kant something called the DST, the deontic symmetry thesis, uh, which, <laughs> which says <laughs> that uh, uh, if you have a duty to do something on your own behalf or a right to do something on your own behalf, uh, then uh, you have that duty or right to do it on behalf of, of somebody else. Because you are not special. Exactly. It doesn't, it shouldn't matter whether the person you were doing it for is you or someone else. Kant would not have made a good parent. <laughs> Granted. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I can just imagine. Uh, but, uh, okay. Uh, and, and he has this whole explanation of why he doesn't think that uh, that you have. I, I would think that would be clear, given the time in our lives we just <laughs> went through. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ben got it for me. Yeah. Um, and he has this whole explanation of why he thinks that you actually if you like really read closely in a cod uh, that he thinks you don't actually have a perfect duty not to lie. You only have a perfect duty not to act on maxims like lie when it's convenient or, you know, lie, you know, you like various things, but, uh, but Cholby thinks we can carve out a maxim that passes the test. Uh, that uh, that that we don't have a perfect duty not to act on. He also points out that like most people, like McCarty, when they're trying to give Kantian explanations of why you can lie to the inquiry murderer, uh, old, like at best, like with the whole trap question thing, they could only what all they could get out of it is a right to lie to the inquiry murderer, and that seems a little that doesn't quite seem like what we're looking for. Like just that you have a right to do that. I mean that's good, but it doesn't seem like enough. If somebody said, um, well, you can <laughs> now you don't have to, but you can. No, yeah, if I was at home and this whole situation with, with Andy mm -hmm. played out, uh, the guy in the hockey mask, uh, and, and then I came home later and I asked Jen what happened while I was gone. I was like, Oh, did Andy leave? And she's like, well, uh, well, I had the right to lie to the murderer, but I decided not to. And right. yeah, it, Jay Andrews dead in the backyard. Yeah. I would think that, um, like intuitively, you don't just have a right mm -hmm. to, you have a duty to it. You're An doing obligation. something seriously wrong if you don't do so. Yeah. Um, and and so like the McCarty kind of explanations can't capture that. One thing that does seem like a problem though for both of them, uh, I read these papers a long time ago because I was teaching a class when we were adjuncts at, Ruck at Rutgers. I taught a class called uh, Hume Kant in the 18th century. And we read some of the stuff then, but I reread these papers this afternoon. And um, like, especially the Cholby one, there's a lot of clever stuff going on in it, but I guess one issue that I had with that is that I wonder if you could like use the same strategy to get to do lots of stuff that clearly Kantians aren't okay with. <clears throat> like, um, I don't know if you could yank somebody onto the trolley tracks in front of you. Is that like, is that okay? Cause you have a perfect duty to preserve your life. I'm, you know, no, you have a perfect duty to preserve life. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Joshua, um, not that this is simple exactly, but it's very thin and readable to someone who does have an interest in it. You should read groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. And that is probably the simplest explanation. Yeah. I would also out of the horse's mouth, so to speak. Fair enough. Uh, I would also recommend if you are going to read the groundwork for metaphysics of morals, uh, 
not all translations are created equal. Uh, and uh, for all that stuff, um, there's a website called Early Modern Texts, like text messages, texts.com. Uh, uh, so earlymoderntexts.com uh, with has free online translations of a bunch of these things. And they tend to be very um, clear translations. Uh, like if, you know, like, cause it's, there are different ways that like when you're translating something like that, you can do it as a, None of that happened. Uh, it's a damn lie. Uh, but, uh, don't curse. Your mother-in-law is going to watch this. Don't lie. <laughs> so um, what happened was. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was. We were, oh, boy. We left a restaurant. We went to our very favorite Mexican restaurant. We had a very nice dinner there. We did. We were, I thought... We had just been married not that long before. We were on our way home, and Jed said, uh, let's get ice cream. I mm -hmm. thought she meant let's stop and buy ice cream. No, to, we were out on this date where we just had home. dinner, and I said, let's get ice cream. So Ben starts steering me. We're walking. He starts steering me towards the 7-Eleven, and I'm like, Ben? I thought she meant... Just because you're married now does not mean that 7-Eleven is an acceptable date destination I, did not think it was a date destination. I thought we could I thought you meant let's pick up some ice cream on no, our way I home meant let's go for home. ice cream yes. in a romantic kind of way <laughs> well now I know that so <laughs> was that the night that Cold Stone Creamery was also closed it was yes yeah they had a the air conditioning an air conditioning problem we went over there they weren't in they weren't open because of an air conditioning problem then we went to insomnia cookies and we got ice cream, which was very, turned out to be not the right move because their ice cream isn't that good, but their cookies are delicious. There you go. But anyway, yeah. So Ben tried to take me to 7-Eleven on a date. That is a wildly, because wildly inaccurate we summary We had just gotten happened. married, like what, a couple weeks before that? And he was like, ah, I can start being cheap now. It's not all what happened there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I... I I love hockey. Uh, you know, I that is that is my favorite sport. But I will I will also admit that it is a, it is a bit violent. Uh, typically, there aren't murders. Uh, but uh, there was when that one guy his foot went like straight up and sliced, sliced the neck the, of that yeah. other guy. That was yeah, that's relatively that rare. was intense. That's relatively rare. Uh, <laughs> but also I, not intentional. Yeah. But there is, there is a you know a decent amount of like phys of violence like if if uh, if like two players got no no got and we have been married now for almost how many years seven, seven? there's still no seven eleven date sorry um, I mean if if two players and opposing teams got into a fist fight in the middle of a uh, NBA game that would be like off the Malice side, in side the of the palace the court. Uh, that would be a big big deal. Uh, it, with hockey, it's like you know you spend you know like uh, you have to go to the penalty box for a little while. There's no further con like the commentators have all these little euphemisms for it. Oh, a lot of physicality in this one. Go to the penalty box, have a nice refreshing beverage. <laughs> exactly. Um, He's a Red Wings fan, right? I'm not into hockey, so. Yeah, you uh, you went to a game with me, I think. But. I did. I went to a game. We were in. California over Christmas and his parents gave him tickets. Who did we see? I don't even know who we saw. Well, it was the Kings, but I don't remember who they were playing. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was great. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's, so that's one thing. Uh, also, it seems like all of these solutions have a big problem, which is that like, some of these guys who write these papers can be very convincing. These like latter day Kantians uh, can be very convincing. About guys and women. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, Barbara Herman, I think, has written about this. So, um, so they can be very convincing about how there's some sort of formula of humanity ish reason uh, to lie or at least to be allowed to lie to the inquiry murderer. Uh, but 
there's always this big problem, which is that Kant says that the formula of humanity, the formula of universal law are supposed to be equivalent. You're supposed to get all the same results. And they, so all these papers have to start to get a little hand wavy when they start talking about the formula of universal law, because uh, it seems like if the maxim lie to inquire and murderers were universalized uh, and we can even just restrict ourselves to the version of it to get around that whole problem with the inquiring dog owners and all that. Like we can just say, how about the specific version where the inquiry murderer says, hello, is J. Andrew World here? I intend to murder him. <laughs> okay, can you lie to him? And it seems like- First I'd be like, dude, why? <laughs> what did he do? <laughs> it seems like you have a big problem with the formula of uh, universal law because if um but how because if you universalize the maxim lie to inquiring murderers who announce their intentions uh then no inquiring murderer would believe you and the lie wouldn't work so very smart very smart this is uh this is a little tricky um and i kind of think the most honest uh, Kantian ways around this. I mean, obviously, you could just like, uh, obviously, partisans of other moral theories just say, "Ah, see, Kantianism is bunk." Uh, but I kind of think the most honest Kantian answers are the ones who admit that you have to, like, if you don't want to bite the bullet and say that you should tell the truth to the inquiry murderer or be evasive, which might be the same thing as telling the truth. Uh, if they if they want to admit that obviously the right thing to do is to lie and lie convincingly uh, to the inquiry murderer, that you have to revise the theory a little bit to accommodate this. That you have to say, well, maybe these aren't completely universal. Maybe you just have... Like maybe the, all this business about not treating people merely as a means and all that, like maybe it captures some really important reason that we have morally to treat people in certain ways, but maybe it's not a totally indefeasible reason. Uh, and that's all right, Henry. You're not going to need it in um, in real life. <laughs> well, what if there's an inquired murder at the door and he has to reason about what to do? Oh yeah. Well. <laughs> Yeah, he can pull this up and watch it. Be, hang on a second, I need to watch this podcast again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hold, hold on, I'm just out of phone to, to, to put the, you know, find the YouTube channel. <laughs> Here, murder. Sit down and watch this with me. <laughs> exactly. Have a nice lemonade. <laughs> oh Woo. my God, there's a Simpsons for that. Anyway. Uh, so, How is this possible? <laughs> um, yeah. So anyway, uh, have we uh, have have we covered the inquiry murder to? I guess your satisfaction. I I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I I think it's I, there. Also, let let me throw this out there. So you know, our students. Well, I would try to mislead I would you know you don't have to flat out lie you can kind of mislead if you say something misleading it's better than lying but then you could say but is it is it really better because let's suppose that I want to murder Jay Andrew mm -hmm. and I know that Jay Andrew has a horrendous peanut allergy I don't know if he does or not but let's say he does and I'm aware that he does and he comes over <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, well, even more now. And uh, Jay Andrew comes over for dinner and he sees what I, you know, I've got this stuff in a big pot and I'm stirring it and it looks really good. And then what are you doing? And I, I um, have to find something that Andy sent me. Keep going, keep going. So where was I? So I'm stirring this stuff in a big pot and, and Jay Andrew says, you know, I'm allergic to peanuts, right? And I say, there are no peanuts in this. I can't believe, okay. Uh, Jay J Andrew says, you know, I'm allergic to peanuts. And I say, there are no peanuts in this, but I've made it with peanut oil. 
and he eats it and he dies, which is what I had in mind all along. I didn't lie to Jay Andrew. There are no peanuts in it, but there's peanut oil. So I misled him into thinking that it wouldn't kill him would in fact it did kill him so is that any better than just flat out lying and saying no there's nothing peanut in in this um because either way you're doing it for the same reason i, I would have the same motivation which was to kill jay andrew and it would all come to the same thing so was it really better to mislead than to lie um it's not really clear that it is yeah so this is uh so what? Okay. Sorry, I couldn't tell if that was a Ben's having Okay, so, sorry, I was <laughs> I was misinterpreting something. Uh, Seven eleven. <laughs> you were you were just like letting go. <laughs> I don't know what's going okay, on anymore. So this is a paper. Uh, by uh, Jennifer Saul, one of the non-guys who's written about this uh, that I was so righteously corrected earlier okay. for, uh, for my erasure of. Uh, That's also a good point. I could add the peanuts. No, there are no peanuts in here. And then he walks on through to uh, take his coat and his shoes off and I dump in the peanuts. Yeah, so uh, Jennifer Saul has a paper called Just Go Ahead and Lie uh, where she, uh, where she, yeah, make, might as well, where she makes some of these points uh, that we've been talking about and says that the idea that like just like sometimes Kantians who will actually try to defend what Kant said about this instead of just saying like oh old man Kant just need to go to sleep or you know or uh, <laughs> or or doing one of these sophisticated you know moves that we talked about but, but Kantians who actually try to defend what Kant said about this uh, will. Uh, will sometimes try to say, oh, there really is a big difference between just being evasive and lying that's morally important. Uh, like uh, Michael Sandel has a video about this. You can see on YouTube from one of his lectures at Harvard, where it's, uh, it's uh, I don't remember what it's called, but if you just search for Michael Sandel Kant on YouTube, you'll, you'll come up right away. And he has this whole thing about how, well, if you say something that's evasive but technically true, you're paying some tribute to the moral law by refraining from outright lying. And this is the kind of thing that Jennifer Saul is going after in the paper. She's like, no. Your goals are the same. It's really not better. It's, it's not any. You're still trying to achieve a specific end. And, um, you know, does it, does it really matter if the peanuts are in there? Or if it's the peanut oil. Right. Now, uh, she does say that if you think that there is a distinction, a moral distinction, and you do the misleading rather than the lying because you think it's somehow morally better, uh, that says something good about you as a person, that you are trying to do the morally less wrong thing. But now that you've heard this, now all you're trying to do is make yourself feel better because you know that there is actually no moral difference. Yeah. Uh, by the way, somebody asked me about the uh, Stefan Molyneux universally preferable behavior thing earlier. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's really bad. It's like, a, it's like an attempt at saying something Kantish by somebody who either hasn't read or didn't understand Kant. I think Matt McManus is a good review of it somewhere. Uh, read Kant. Like Kant, you know, Kant is better. Talk to Henry. Uh, Henry will tell you why you shouldn't read Kant. But uh, yeah, if you if you want to, um, it's better to just go to the the source. And also, we were not in Providence, sadly. We were in East Lansing. Yeah. Um, I don't know why that's sad, but all right. Uh, I'd like to go to Providence. Uh, Would sure. you like to go to Providence? Sure, but it's probably not better than East Lansing. So, <laughs> in any case. Uh, yeah, it's probably not blazing hot there right now. Yeah, where I'd uh, where I'd come down on on all of this is, I mean, I do think that there's something very right about, like especially the formula of humanity, that that does capture something really important about um, about morality. I think that a lot of things that seem unjust or objectionable, I think it captures the objection really well to say that you're treating people merely. As as means to uh, to to some end, like when 
I don't know, like generals, you know, say, oh, it's okay that we dropped these bombs. There's, you know, some some collateral damage, you know, some civilians died, but, you know, that's, it serves the greater good. You've you know? treated those people solely as a means exactly. to an end, and that does not respect their dignity as human beings. Exactly. So that, that sounds like, 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 I think that, I think that Kant has probably captured something important. But also, I think it, I think that the, it's very intuitive. Also, we just kind of, uh, you know, you ask a class of people, y'all think it's all right to use people? No, nobody's going to say yes. I mean, if they do think that, they're not going to admit it anyway. But sure. Uh, but also, I think that the Benjamin Constant has a point. I think the murder at the door example shows that uh, Kant probably does have to cool it with the like. This is the absolute you know universal rational etc cetera, etc cetera. like eh, is it though, <laughs> is it though? <laughs> all right uh <laughs> so that is as good a, oh before we go of course i have to share yes uh, the, um so jay andrew uh, world uh had uh was inspired as uh to uh create a little art uh for us uh, so <laughs> Uh, are you so it's the manatee in a hockey mask saying, Are you J. Andrew World? No, and then he is thinking, uh, in the thought balloon, I can't believe I lied. Oh, the huge manatee! Oh, and the bloody axe! Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> that is awesome. All right, J. Andrew, you've convinced me. I will no longer uh, tell the murderer the truth, and I will not murder you with peanut oil. <laughs> All right. We'll see. It's a happy ending. So a good place is any to. Uh, Don't you need to plug a bunch of stuff first? Uh, do I? I don't know. I assume you do. Uh, I don't. Oh, actually, I'll say this. So a. Um, uh, so a uh, European philosopher, not unlike Immanuel Kant, uh, Slavoj Žižek, uh, <laughs> Do you think he's like Kant in any way? Yeah, they're philosophers. They're, they, they live in Europe they're somewhere. They're foreign. Uh, they foreigners. Them foreigners. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, he has a uh, he has a really good article that is out today. Uh, where uh, you should read it. You should read it. Um, so let me see if I can. Pull that up uh, right quick. Um, it's not like I've read it, but if Ben thinks you should read it, you should read it. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, so it's uh, we'll talk about it a little bit more on uh, on Monday, uh, but it is a um, the uh, so it's on RT. Uh, the title of the article is uh, the difference between woke and a true awakening. Um, and I promise this is not the only reason I think it's a good article. I actually think that the overall argument of the article is good. But? Uh, but uh, it includes this in the uh, first full paragraph. However, I think Ben Burgess is right. It is claimed the woke agents of cancel culture are, quote, cancel comedians while the world burns, unquote. <laughs> and the, uh, and, and a, there's a lot of overlap between what he talks about in the article and the, uh, and the content of the book. So I was uh, extremely tickled to, uh, to see that. I am a, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Slav Boy. I'm a big fan now. Uh, so uh, Not that I wasn't a fan before. I, yeah, I'm a big fan now. So, oh, thank you. So, yeah. Um, so we'll talk about that on Monday. On Monday, I'm uh, going to get uh, Victor Brazon, uh, one of the co-hosts of uh, Plastic Pills, going to be on the show. Uh, possibly we're going to have a second guest to talk about the election in Peru. Uh, we're still working out the details on that. They have elections that. in Peru? Oh, uh, they do. They just had one. So, yes. And uh, what did they... What did they uh, um, yeah, what in the uh, Paddington uh, darkest Peru? Uh, so uh, Paddington and Paddington Two, best movies, highly recommended. Even if you don't have kids, absolutely. I think we mentioned this before, maybe. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely, highly recommended. Yeah, um, I think Citizen Kane might be better, but you know, I, 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 why? I realize that's officially. A, <laughs> why would you uh, think that? A contrary view now that the uh, that uh, Rotten Tomatoes <laughs> officially <laughs> officially ranks Paddington too. Uh, 
<laughs> but you need to see Paddington one before Paddington two to get the the full Paddington experience. That is awesome. I'm honored. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. Left is best. Team Snoopy forever. <laughs>